President Meyerson will now introduce this morning's opening plenary speakers. Thank you, Keith. Our first plenary speaker this morning is Chief Justice Richard A. Robinson. Justice Robinson was sworn in as Chief Justice on June 18th, 2018, after serving as a Justice of the Supreme Court for more than four years, serving as appellate judge for the appellate court for six years, and in various roles in the Connecticut Superior Court for more than seven years. Before his first appointment to the bench, Justice Robinson worked for the City of Stanford Law Department as staff counsel and rising to assistant corporation counsel. Justice Robinson's career is complemented by numerous awards in public and judicial service positions, including serving as a commissioner on the Connecticut Commission on Human Rights and Opportunities and general counsel for the Connecticut Conference of the NAACP. Among his many accolades, Justice Robinson received the CBA Young Lawyers Section Diversity Award in 2010 and the CBA's Henry J. Narek Judiciary Award in 2017. Please join me in welcoming Chief Justice Robinson. Good day, and thank you for the invitation to address you at today's Connecticut Bar Association's 2020 Legal Conference. I also want to congratulate the leaders of the CBA for your ingenuity in organizing a virtual event of this size. As we all know, this conference was to be in person with more than 1,200 people in attendance. However, COVID-19 hit the scene, and we all know what happened after that. Whether it's the pandemic, the social unrest after the deaths of Elijah McClain, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd, problems with the United States Postal Service, or how Americans will be able to vote in elections, the events of this year have been and continue to be consequential to our legal system and to our future. Sometimes it seems that every day things are getting worse. In our busy lives, we turn to video clips and sound bites for news and let the tenor of these brief snippets shape our outlook. Our mood is at the mercy of the headlines, news feeds, and 140 character messages. We are accustomed to looking to our leaders and other public figures for encouragement and inspiration, and when it isn't readily available, we are easily discouraged. But as lawyers, we know the importance of playing the long game. So in times like these, we need to think a little bit more about the future and how we as lawyers can shape it by our actions. However, in order to accomplish that, we need to start taking care of ourselves. We need to pull ourselves out of this malaise that we have slipped into and rise to the challenge of lawyering in difficult times. In order to do that, we need to look at the sources of our hope, encouragement, and inspiration to give us the motivation to do, to do the difficult job ahead. As for me, I have begun to look closer to home, to people working around me, that are working so very hard to make our lives better. To my judicial branch coworkers, to the justices, the judges, the staff attorneys that I work with every day. To the staff people like our executive legal assistants, Liz, Jennifer, and Courtney. And to many, many others who make the branch run in these most difficult times. I look to the probation officers like Jonathan Coelho, who report to work every day to make sure that the people that are assigned to them are complying with the terms of their probation and thereby making us all a little bit safer. Tragically, we lost Jonathan earlier this year to COVID-19. He was only 32 years old. I will never forget the wonderful things that people were saying at his memorial. His family, his friends, his coworkers, his acquaintances, and attorneys from both sides of the aisle were unanimous in their praise of Jonathan, not only as a great employee, but as a father, a husband, a friend, and an extraordinary human being. I look to the branch's judicial marshals who come face to face with myriad people every single day, not knowing if the individual that they are assisting, transporting, or detaining are ill. Every day, especially when things get tough, I get inspiration from my judicial family. But that is not my only source of inspiration. A lot of my inspiration comes from you, my sisters and brothers in the Connecticut Bar. I have always held a special place in my heart for attorneys, and these recent crises have made that place all that much more special. The kinds of things that we are facing rarely occur, yet we are experiencing them all at once. Our way of life in this country and in this state has been turned upside down. People around us are stressed out, burnt out, and bummed out, and they're looking for solutions. While I am an optimist, 
I know that there are no simple solutions, no magic bullets or elixirs that will bring instant resolution to the things that we are facing. And to be honest with you, at the moment, I don't know what any of those solutions are. But I do know this. We lawyers must be at the forefront thinking about them, finding them, and creating them. As I have said many times before, the law is the fabric that holds this society together. And we as lawyers are the tailors of that cloth with the ethical, moral, and legal responsibility to mend any tears that may occur. Now I recognize that many of us are wearied by the impact of all the things that we've been going through. We must draw upon the resilience that we all have inside and keep putting one foot in front of the other. Frankly, there is no other viable option. What has come through loud and clear over the past few months is that we, lawyers, we must step up and actively play our role as attorneys and lawyers in order to preserve our democratic republic. Please note that I use the word lawyer and attorney. I do not believe these words are synonymous. Several times in the last few years, the Connecticut Supreme Court has given welcoming remarks to new members of the Connecticut Bar. The oath administered on that occasion appears at the very top of the first page of the Connecticut Practice Book, followed immediately by the preamble to the Rules of Professional Conduct. This preamble begins by noting a lawyer, as a member of the legal profession, is a representative of clients. But it doesn't stop there. It also provides that a lawyer is an officer of the legal system and a public citizen having special responsibility for the quality of justice. The preamble uses the word lawyer instead of the word attorney. Some time ago, I came across an article by Ralph Nader and Wesley Smith that discusses both of these terms. The article notes that the words attorney and lawyer are not synonymous. Rather, the article explains the word attorney designates the private role of a legal representative vis-a-vis -vis the client. The word lawyer represents a vitally different duty required by the legal profession, the public role of an officer of the court, whose duties extend beyond the client to serving the justice system and the broader public interest. Both of these roles are essential to effective and ethical legal representation. Without the attorney function, no duties of loyalty would be owed to the client. However, without the lawyer function, legal representation would devolve into an anything goes, whatever it takes to win form of legal Darwinism, where justice would be superseded by the raw power of wealth, status, and connections. Now I know that being a lawyer slash attorney has a certain duality to it. That's probably why there are so many lawyer jokes. Not that I have been amassing any of my own collection to use at post-judgment arguments, but I think that most of us believe that people love their own lawyer, but hate the other side's lawyer. However, I think the truth is probably more complex than that. William Shakespeare focused on this duality in his play, Henry VI. The play includes a scene in which a character named Jack Cade, the leader of a rebellion against the crown, muses about what he would do if he were to seize the throne and become king. It is then that one of his followers, Dick the Butcher, orders what I utters what I believe is the most misunderstood line in all of Shakespeare's writings. Quote, the first thing we do, let's kill all the lawyers, unquote. Cade hardly agrees. While many people believe that Shakespeare was, exp was expressing society's frustration with lawyers and the legal professions, others, including myself, believe that he was actually paying us the ultimate compliment by pointing out that lawyers and the rule of law are the only things protecting society from anarchy. If you want to bring society down and render people powerless, the first thing you must do is get rid of the rule of law and all of those who fight to protect it. John Curtin, a former president of the American Bar Association, once remarked, anyone who believes a better day dawns when lawyers are eliminated has the burden of explaining who will take their place, who will protect the poor, the injured, the victims of negligence, the victims of discrimination, the victims of violence. Lawyers are the simple yet essential mean at which people seek to vindicate their rights. And we must never allow the foreclosure of that means. 
Lately, I've been thinking a lot about the history of our country. And like many of you, I'm worried about our future. Do we have the will to continue this great experiment of being the greatest democratic republic the world has ever known? I think so. But it will be up to us lawyers to step up to our obligations in order to make that happen. Think about the times in our history when that didn't happen. Think about those times when things went horribly wrong, like in Dred Scott versus Sanford, where Chief Justice Taney issued an opinion about the rights of black people living in this country. He said, they had for more than a century before been regarded as beings of an inferior order and altogether unfit to associate with the white race, either in social or political relations, and so far inferior that they had no rights which the white man was bound to respect, and that the Negro might justly and lawfully be reduced to slavery for his benefit. Think about Japanese Americans being placed in internment camps, while at the same time thousands of pro-Nazi German Americans marched openly and participated in large public rallies. Think about the last great economic collapse in this country. Think about how those times in histories where lawyers either didn't act or didn't act quickly enough. Think of all the destruction of property, of life, of health, of wealth that occurred because of it. Lawyers are not merely players sitting on the bench. Not only are we necessary players, we are leaders. Every one of us at this virtual event has the ability to lead and in fact, must lead to get us through this crisis. In leadership, courage matters. Now that's not to say lawyers might not feel afraid, that you may not feel afraid. Fear is an equal opportunity emotion. The distinction though, is that the leaders push on. They inspire each other. So if the solution that you decide upon doesn't work, you must move on and figure out a new solution. We as leaders must listen to people who come to our courts or visit our law offices looking for help. Some of them are saying our legal system is broken, that it doesn't work, that there is no justice. I would suggest that as leaders, you need to probe further. You need to ask more questions. You need to see if there's something that we can do to improve the system so that we can instill hope and that their causes, their problems, and their lives do in fact matter. Good leaders are empathetic. They listen, even when they don't like what they're hearing. This takes courage, and we need to ensure it's not in short supply. It also takes courage to change a culture. I've been lucky to have learned from previous chief justices who displayed great courage in taking on certain aspects of our branch's own culture. The branch continues to evolve under my tenure, and the current crisis has afforded us with some new opportunities. We have become more efficient. We are improving every system that we possibly can we're exploiting new technologies to deliver better and faster services. We're cutting down on unnecessary in-person contact. In criminal cases, I'm hoping that this leads to fewer failures to appear. In civil and family cases, I'm hoping for quicker resolutions to matters that are brought before the court. We are taking this opportunity to double down on our mission to serve the interests of justice and the public by resolving matters before the branch in a fair, timely, efficient, an open manner. Now I recognize everything I've mentioned is a pretty tall order and not for the faint of heart. It's time to stop the generational baton passing and roll up our sleeves and do what's right, what is fair and what is just. That's what leaders do. And both the branch and the entire legal community are in a unique position to bring about meaningful and lasting change. It has been a long, tough road for our democracy and for our system of justice. But as my wife Nancy sometimes remind me, the struggle for America to live up to its ideals is not a sprint, but a marathon. Our country will always have its flaws. After all, we are flawed. That's the admission for being a human being. Yet we still have our most cherished values, principles, and dreams. And their survival is worth every ounce of energy and our, our ability. If I may paraphrase the late Representative John Lewis, I will leave you with this following thought. Ours is not the struggle of one day, one week, or even one year. Ours is a struggle of a lifetime, or maybe even many lifetimes, 
and each and every one of us in every generation must do our part. It has been my pleasure to address you today, and I wish you nothing but the best as we move forward during these challenging times. Thank you, Justice Robinson, for joining us and for your moving remarks. I would now like to introduce our second plenary speaker, American Bar Association President Patricia Lee Rifo. President Rifo is a partner at Snell & Wilmer LLP in Phoenix, Arizona, where she chairs the firm's Professional Liability Litigation Group. She practices in the areas of complex commercial litigation and internal investigation. Trish is a past chair of the ABA House of Delegates and the ABA Section of Litigation. During her presidential term, she's committed to advancing the rule of law and the cause of justice. Welcome, Trish, to the Connecticut Legal Conference. Thank you for this opportunity to be with you this morning. It's a special honor and privilege to help open the conference with Chief Justice Robinson. Just as the Connecticut Bar Association is featuring prominent judges in its terrific programming this week, the American Bar Association works closely with the judiciary in everything we do. Um, we do that because the organized bar needs the judiciary's continued involvement and critical leadership to promote excellence in our profession and to pursue equal justice under law for all. And let me say a word about your fabulous new president, Amy Lynn Meyerson. Amy is an outstanding bar leader and she has given so much of her time, talent and smarts to our profession. She is of course a past president of NAPABA, the National Asian Pacific American Bar Association, which has partnered with the ABA on so many initiatives over the years. She's a past chair of the ABA Solo Small Firm and General Practice Division, which provides critical insight and support to our association from the profession's largest demographic. And five years ago, Amy and I were together on a field at Runnymede in England to celebrate the 800th anniversary of the sealing of Magna Carta, a magnificent celebration, uh, which included members of the royal family, the prime minister, and even the Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, so Amy, thank you for your longstanding friendship and we look forward to a fabulous year of leadership here in Connecticut. This certainly has not been the bar year that any of us expected to have. Our conventions have been canceled or moved to virtual. Uh, our plans for the year have been written up and redone more than a couple of times. And we still don't really know what we face in the months ahead. And then, of course, there are the well-meaning colleagues who have come up to me with some version of, I'm so sorry, you worked so hard for this, and it's just not going to be the year that you expected. And I've taken to responding to that by saying, you're right, it's not going to be the year I expected. It's going to be even better. And I believe that. I believe we have an opportunity in this moment of disruption to be change agents in a way we would never have the chance to be in a more normal year. And when I say change agents, I don't mean that in any partisan political sense. I mean that in a lawyer bar association sense. The pandemic has completely upended our communities and our lives. It's also upended our practices, our courtrooms, our law schools, our bar exams, pretty much everything about what lawyers do and how we do it. And we are facing and will continue to face a tsunami of legal needs arising out of this pandemic in evictions, foreclosures, bankruptcies, domestic violence, and a host of other legal needs. And on top of that, our colleagues in the Gulf Coast just experienced another hurricane, and our colleagues in California and here in Arizona are working against horrible wildfires, and so it goes. And at the same time, the cries for racial justice 
and an end to systemic racism continue to reverberate on our streets and in our hearts. Lawyers are the stewards of the American justice system, and we therefore have to own the shortcomings in that system that disadvantage Black Americans, that build barriers for Black Americans to overcome that white Americans do not. And we also have to own the barriers inside our own profession, in our law firms and in our other practice settings that disadvantage Black lawyers and that make it vastly harder for Black lawyers to thrive in all aspects of diversity, equity, and inclusion, we simply must do better. And with these and many more challenges before us, we will do what American lawyers have done since they helped to found this country. We, as lawyers, will get to work to help solve these problems. The American Bar Association is the largest voluntary organization of lawyers in the world. And when we work with the force multiplying effect of our partners in the state and local bars across the country, the work and influence that we can do together is extraordinary. To say that this has been a time of change in our profession is a huge understatement. I like to say that we've squished about 10 years of change into the last six or seven months. And with all of that change and disruption comes real opportunity. And that's where our focus is. So I wanna briefly outline for you four initiatives that the American Bar Association is working on right now. The first is our Practice Forward initiative, which is coordinating the work across the ABA and uh, collecting resources from state and local bars across the country to respond to the many changes in the practice of law as a consequence of this pandemic. Which changes will be permanent and which changes will go away once we are all back in our offices? Virtual hearings are almost certainly here to stay, at least in some form. So how can we help our courts develop policies and best practices? And what new skills do lawyers need to learn to be more effective in a virtual or partly virtual environment? What new ethical and professional responsibility issues will arise to the extent that our profession stays at least partly virtual? How do we mentor and raise up young lawyers? And how do we address the important issues of lawyer wellness in a virtual or partly virtual world? These are only a few of the questions that our profession has to answer. And together, we need to get to work to answer them. In addition to making sense in the changes in how we practice, we must continue our commitment to addressing the public's staggering legal needs, particularly in our underserved communities. So our second significant initiative at the ABA is our task force on legal needs arising out of the pandemic, which is coordinating a variety of pro bono and legal services efforts across the United States to address all of the legal needs in our underserved communities arising out of this pandemic. A third front we've opened is our intensified work with respect to racial equity and anti-racism. The ABA's Center for Diversity and Inclusion has long been leading on these issues and it will continue to do so in the coming months as we continue to serve as indispensable resources on these important issues. We have asked every single entity inside the American Bar Association, of which there are more than a few, to move issues of racial equity and anti-racism to the very top of their agenda for the coming year. Fourth, we just announced uh, a week ago, a new initiative called Poll Worker Esquire, Poll Worker, ESQ. 
in partnership with the National Association of Attorneys General and the National Association of State Election Directors. We are working to get lawyers in every state and, and territory, every county and every city across the country of every political persuasion to sign up as a poll worker to help ensure a free and fair election this November. This is something that lawyers and law students are uniquely capable of doing and the need has never been greater. As you surely know, traditionally, poll workers um, skew older and may be more susceptible to and vulnerable to the virus that we are all fighting. So our chance to serve is to step up and serve as a poll worker in their place across the country. And I hope you will join me in getting that word out, in signing up yourself, because I've signed up to be a poll worker, uh, and serving on election day or in some states like mine, even before election day. Nothing is more important than making sure everyone's vote counts this fall. You know, lawyers are trained to see all sides of an issue. That's what we do. But we can only stand on one side. So let's take a moment to be clear about where we stand. We stand for a judiciary that is fair, impartial, and independent of every administration. We stand for the equal treatment of every person by the police and by the justice system. We stand for the rule of law in which every person and the government are held to account and where laws are administered fairly and without regard to privilege. We stand for free and fair elections, underscored as we mark the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment. Free and fair elections where every eligible citizen gets to vote without impediment and have their vote counted. We will stand for these values here at home and around the world. In countries where the light of justice is just emerging and in countries where there are threats to extinguish that light altogether. We will continue to provide the very best continuing legal education and professional development and leadership opportunities to ensure that lawyers are serving their clients with the utmost knowledge and professionalism. We will persist in our intensified efforts to promote mental health and well being among lawyers. And we will authoritatively represent lawyers in the halls of Congress, the administration, and other opportunities to advance our values of an independent profession committed to due process and justice for all. The ABA cannot serve as the national voice for the legal profession without our partnership with the state bars and support from our members. So if you're already a member of the ABA, thank you for your support and please know that your support matters. And if you're not yet a member of the ABA, I hope you'll take a moment to look at our website, consider the resources and the opportunities that we offer to our members to make you a better lawyer and a better professional. In Connecticut and throughout the nation, we have a lot of work to do together. And I look forward to doing that work with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Trish. I'd like to thank our opening plenary sponsors, Cronholm Insurance Services and Liberty Bank. Cronholm is a CBA endorsed provider of professional liability, auto, homeowner, umbrella insurance, probate bonds, committee, liability, office packages, and workers' compensation, disability income plan, and employment practices liability products. Do not miss the CLC session, Safe Harbors and Calm Seas, on Tuesday and Wednesday at 2 p.m. to earn up to 7.5% premium credit off two years on professional liability insurance offered through this CBA exclusively endorsed program underwritten 
by CNA. Established in 1825, Liberty Bank is Connecticut's oldest and largest mutual bank with over 6 billion in assets and 60 banking offices in Connecticut. As a full service financial institution, Liberty offers consumer and commercial banking, cash management, home mortgages, insurance and investment services. Named top workplace by the Hartford Current, Liberty maintains a long-standing commitment to superior personal service and unparalleled community involvement. 